Cult of the Dead Cow is a group of computer hackers who first came to my attention through word of mouth. I then found their website on the World Wide Web. Using the internet, they were able to create an identity for themselves as being one of the most elite computer hacker groups in the world. This website also served as a distribution center for BackOffice, a program developed by the Cult of the Dead Cow. You could read all the files on their drive, upload files to their drive, you could delete files from their drive, you could format the drive, you could you could do anything you want. The back office has exposed the weaknesses in security in Microsoft Windows operating systems. The emails Gentlemen, to evil! <laughs> to evil! One out of ten Windows computers on the internet right now, you can just connect to it and walk around on their hard drive without any password or anything. A lot of people are just now realizing that like, when they connect to the internet from a Windows machine, all of their file sharing and all of that is fully accessible on the internet. Download it. The excuse to get a computer used to be to uh, you know, for, oh, like I need it for school or, you know, like I need it, you know, oh, to like do my finances when it would really be for games. Uh, you buy it for games, but really it's porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need it, I need it for email and I need it for, you know, for the web, you know, it's like how I get information, it's how I get my news. Hacking. There's lots of forms of hacking. It's, it's a mindset, and I mean, I think that there's, as long as there have been people, there's been people who've done that. My handle is taken from a, a bondage comic book from the 20s. The character, Sir District Darcy, is always trying to do evil things, but always bungles it and ends up doing good inadvertently. I first got it, you know, I first started using them, um, getting online, like, and getting involved in, like, the computer underground or whatever in, like, 85. Global domination through media saturation. <laughs> CEC is pretty much a, um, it's a social club, um, or at least New Hack is a place for this, for this social club. And um, rather than having bake sales or uh, smoking cigars and uh, handling brandy snifters, we uh, work with computers and networks and um, write text files and put our opinions out and uh, cause mayhem. Cause mayhem. That's good. That's, that's excellent. <laughs> On Sunday morning, the New York Times discovered that its website had been taken over by hackers who called themselves HFG, standing for Hacking for Girlies. The newspaper's homepage had disappeared. Instead, viewers saw images of naked women and statements of support for an imprisoned hacker named Kevin Mitnick. What's really popular in the news, which is the, the cyber crime, stuff like that, the changing of web pages. Well, one of the things we really want to separate ourselves from is like the whole idea of hacktivism is like web page hacks and like, you know, going in and going in and doing like, yo dudes, fucking Portuguese has to like fucking free East Timor and shit, word to my homies, out, you know. I just think more subtle ways of doing it are better, like the New York Times hack if they'd fucked with an article. Hey, you know, like, could the archives have been, you know, tampered with and changed? Yep. And the New York Times claimed, oh, no, 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 you know, like, that wouldn't be possible. Um, whatever showed up, like, would obviously be absurd and, like, anyone would notice. And, I mean, one of the reasons that when they changed the page at that time, it was so, you know, like, devastating, was the release of the, uh, the Star Report. Yep. Um, like... They could have changed the star report, and would it, would it have seemed absurd? I thought, you know, the cigar thing was kind of absurd. <laughs> what we're going to do here just now is uh, simulate uh, an attack on a system uh, over the Internet that uh, would have their shares enabled and passworded. 
and we're going to use uh, a program called attack.exe that's going to run through a dictionary and open up the, the box so that it allow me to connect to it and put on the back orifice server. The back orifice server is a Trojan, uh, sort of a Windows 95 uh, root kit, if you will, which will allow me to take uh, remote access control of uh, the uh, target computer. Okay, we're all set. We're going to run the attack program. We attempted the password Clinton, attempted the password Lewinsky, attempted the password Fellatio, attempted the password Star, attempted the password Whitewater, attempted the password Phone Tap, Trip, Oval Office, Stained, Impeach, and Cigar. And here's it. Cigar was the uh, the password on the uh, shared machine. I've connected to the share and I now have access to the machine. You should look at the sharing control panel and see if you're, <clears throat> see if somebody's actually on. If you believe that a law is unjust, you not only have a right to display that law, you have a responsibility. I, I don't like the term cracker. I think it's a stupid term. Yeah. Cracker, I'm gonna go back to my trailer home, drink my, my paps. One person with knowledge can actually make a difference. You know, you, you, can, you can literally change the world. Our major focus with Back Orifice is the sheer fact that the world's most popular operating system, regardless of who manufactures it, uh, just happens to be wide open to attacks over the internet. And that's a real problem, especially when you're giving this uh, operating system to fairly non-technical people who may have bought their first computer ever. And they're going onto the internet because they're told that you know, it's, it's relatively safe. Well, it's not. So basically what we, we suggest is any Windows 95 user install NetWatcher and leave it open all the time. I'm the ordinary user who is watching pornography instead of his computer, so... I wouldn't, I wouldn't notice this thing on NetWatcher. <laughs> For the BO server to become, uh, like, activated, uh, we actually have to uh, get the machine, the target machine, to reboot. We have Windows 95 and we're immune to that? Oh my god, so we went... <laughs> no. No. no! Sorry! So, I'm going to uh, send, uh, like, basically force a dialog box on them. It rubs the lotion on its body. It rubs the lotion on its body or it gets rebooted. It's the default dialogue, I thought. <laughs> no, 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 that's not the default dialogue. I thought that was the system dialogue. How do I know that was from you? Oh, yeah, almost hit. No. Almost hit. Yeah. Um. There's like there's sites with uh, screenshots that have like hundreds of screenshots. Uh, my favorite one was uh, it's a screenshot. So because you can you can take screenshots of that orifice and you can pop up dialog boxes. So there's a lot where people will pop up a dialog box on someone else's computer and then take a screenshot of it. So there's one. It's someone yeah. It's someone someone with their Microsoft money with Microsoft money open with their personal finances and 50 dialog boxes in front of it that all say I bet you're wet in your pants right now. <laughs> <laughs> what we want, really want is for people with skills to actually start going out there and doing stuff, like finding out shit. The reasonable man conforms to society, whereas the unreasonable man expects society to conform to him. Therefore, all progress is made by unreasonable men. Are we unreasonable? I consider myself very unreasonable. I, I am working on a product which, which would pr protect against not only you know, programs like Back Orifice, but any virus or any... Um, any hostile program or even any like bugs in, in known programs. And I do plan to charge on it, so charge for it rather. So we'll see. I mean, I'm sure, you know, there'll be a lot of people going, oh ho, now we know why he released that evil program, but in truth, 
I expected, you know, the industry to come up with some kind of protection against this because, you know, all the protection that they're offering right now, you know, scanning for back orifice and blocking port 31337, that's all fine and dandy, but that's only going to protect you against back orifice, this exact version of back orifice. If we change our program or anybody else writes a program like it, and it's not hard to write, it's very, very simple, um, then, it's not, then people have absolutely no protection. And that's the awareness that we we're trying to raise. It's, it's really frustrating that nobody has actually come up with a decent solution for it. Someone probably wouldn't even notice the number of times that you know Windows crashes, uh, even though I sent a reboot command. So that's why we're here in a secret location. Whereabouts are unknown to the film crew. Right. I drove you around for six days. Yeah. You know, it's here that most of the, a third of the nets uh, of the world's net access comes from the, the Bay Area. That's not true. Actually, a third of the world's net access comes from Lubbock, Texas. I don't think of any new music stories. I'm using a. Nothing that should be said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much. <laughs> Nothing that I want documented on film. Well, you know. Do you realize that uh, Benjamin Franklin had the largest collection of pornography? He was a lech. Like you, you, ne you never hear about like this part of like history, like like you know like the weird things about the founding fathers. Like Benjamin Franklin had the largest collection of like pornographic et etchings in like the 13 colonies. <laughs>